for Teoflos to record. Uh, in the last bit of last session, we went through inflation with added examples when it came to calculating inflation. So in this section, I'll go through the definitions and then we'll go into the causes uh, of inflation, okay? So inflation, as we said, refers to the rising general level of prices in the economy. So how is the price level changing? Is it increasing okay, on inflation? And as I explained last week, it does not mean that the price of every single item in the basket is increasing, okay? Some prices may be on change, but others may be falling, others will be increasing. But the average effect is look at the cost of the basket month on month or year on year, okay? So I, I do the basket and some of the things in the basket, okay? Rising inflation means that the rate at which price the general price increases is rising. So if you say we have rising inflation, we expect that prices, um, uh, what is the, so we are in April, prices in May will be slightly higher than prices in, uh, uh, in, in, in April, but the issue is the magnitude of change, okay? From April to May and from February, March to April, what is the magnitude, okay? So, it's you cannot say price you expect it to be constant. Uh, the cost of doing business have risen. Other things in the the supply side shocks can lead to higher prices. So rising inflation means that the rate at which price the general price level increase or increases is rising. Okay, so it's increasing. But if that rate is rising, then you have rising inflation. Okay, so you have. 10% inflation and all of a sudden inflation is 15% uh, and it's rising inflation. Okay. Falling inflation means that the rate at which the price level, the price rise is falling, but not that prices are falling. Okay. So if we say we have falling inflation, it, it means that maybe we, the inflation rate was 15% uh, uh, last month and now it's 12% uh, and then the, another month, it, 10% and it's falling. It doesn't mean that prices are falling. It's just that the rate of increase, the rate of change is falling. Okay, this is very important. Okay. So if you started from a higher, the high 20s and you are coming down to 10 or 12, then it's falling inflation. Okay. When the general price level is falling, then we have deflation. Okay. So when you have deflation on a general price level, uh, is falling. All right. So as I said, uh, we've gone through the calculations from the last session. So this just to present it again. So the inflation rate, the rate of inflation is measured as a percentage change in a consumer price index, the CPI. So the, the index for a basket in a particular year minus that of the previous year or previous period. Okay. So if it's month on month, then it's this month minus that the previous month. Okay. So CPI times T minus CPI in a previous period, uh, over CPI in a previous period, okay? And we looked at some examples. Uh, as I explained in the last session, the CPI means the cost of a market basket of consumer goods relative to the cost of the same bundle in a base year, okay? So the CPI, is the, what is the cost of the basket in May? The things that we typically consume uh, with fuel prices increasing, the cost of the basket probably have increased compared to the cost in a base year, okay? So the items that make up the basket and the CPI are chosen to reflect the goods and services typically consume. And I also explained that. So there will be the things we consume, the tomatoes, the cassava, the things that the average Ghanaian consumes. These are the things that will be in the basket. And um, if I remember correctly, we talked about the GDP deflator as one of the uh, price indices. And then this consumer price index, which I've just mentioned, I also mentioned it's another example. So in general, a price index is a single measure of all prices of goods and services in an economy. If it's, if it's the GDP deflator, then the, the items that uh, constitute the GDP, the, the, the output that constitutes the GDP. 
If it's the consumer price index, then it's the output or the goods that are in that basket. So it's a single measure. And last week we used like 100, uh, 120, and then we differenced the CPI to get the inflation. Okay. If you are here to review the material, please do that as soon as possible. So price in the index are used for calculating inflation as uh, I showed and I indicated that the types of price index uh, indices, we have GDP deflator, which we talked about, nominal GDP divided by real GDP times 100, uh, consumer price index, which we typically will use to okay, the cost of the living or capture the extent to which the cost of living is changing. And then we also have the producer price index. And as I indicated last week, the producer price index is to have an understanding how the cost of uh, production is changing. So the typical inputs that a, a firm in Ghana will buy, how has the prices in that, that basket, the producer's basket, how is it changing? Okay. Labor cost, electricity cost, all these things. Okay. So uh, we measure all these indicators. Normally, as I said, the consumer price index is the one that is uh, pop, uh, made popular that people make um, a point about because that's what we use to calculate the inflation. But uh, producer price index is also very important because it helps. Uh, okay, okay. It helps. Um, I'll share the slides with you guys. I've been trying since morning to upload it to Sakai. So um, what's the name? Uh, two floors. Let's talk after that and let me send it to you. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. So that is the three that we have consumer price, producer price, and GDP deflator. Um, CPI, we are saying that we've gone through that it's a measure of the overall price of goods and services bought by a typical consumer, and it's a measure of the cost of living for typical households. And that is why the focus has been on that. Typical households, typical urban consumer. So what we do is that even though we, it's reported at the national level that inflation rates are around 10%, 9%, 11%, the report that comes out, we have inflation rate for even um, regions. So regional level inflation, mm -hmm. uh, and then we have it for food and non-food inflation. Okay, so. I know that it's reported at inflation level, but you find that even inflation, the general price level for the entire country could be 11% or 12%, but greater Accra can be around 15 or 17%, okay? But Ashanti region will probably be a, it's much lower most of the time. People say the cost of living there is much cheaper. So you find that it will have a lower inflation rate. Up, uh, all the other regions, voter region, you see all the regions, Western in the mix. So you can tell if you are using inflation to make a decision where to live, then you kind of pick where the cost of living is cheaper and then you move there, but it doesn't work like that, right? Because then probably, possibly your income levels will not be that high in those regions. Okay? But if you can get a higher income in a low cost region, that is like a dream come true. Right. So that is the idea. It measures the cost of uh, living. It measures the cost of living um, for a typical household. Okay. So the consumer price index is ref preferred index for calculating consumer inflation, as I have been indicating. All right. How do we actually calculate this? Okay. So try as much as possible to follow the calculation. So the first step one, which I uh, also hinted by fixing the basket. So the step one is fix the market basket, okay? meaning that identify all the consumer goods that are important for calculating inflation based on consumer preferences within the country. Okay? So in a, it's impossible to have a basket for Ghana without cassava or plantain, right? And if you take maybe the Indian basket, you probably have to capture in the Indian bread or chapati or the European type of stuff, right? So baskets for each country would differ depending on the type of goods 
the typical consumer or purchase. So fix that basket. So on the whiteboard, I fixed it by drawing a circle, okay? And then putting some stars in the circle, okay? So choose the items and consume the consumer, uh, choose the item uh, that consumers, as I said, will typically uh, purchase, giving more weight to the, the more purchased items. So if there is some items that have more weight, then you can give them more weight. Find the price of the baskets. Now, Saskatchewan service will go around the, uh, the big markets or the satellite markets, and then ask for the prices of pepper, tomato, salt, everything that we consume standardized into kgs. We will look at an example in a jiffy. Okay. And once we have the basket, as I did last week, you compute the cost of the basket. What is, how much, what is the price, the value of that basket, the cost of the basket for a typical consumer or an average consumer? And then once you have the prices, you fix the base year to compute the CPI, the consumer price index, cons or any of the indices. So let's take an example. Consider the typical market basket for the following goods. Okay, so this is, if you assume that this is our basket for a typical household, okay, uh, for a month, six sachet of pure water, three balls of kenke and five fish. Okay. So that is the typical um, uh, basket for a consumer. The following table contains the prices for these, uh, these three, for three years. So in 2012, the sachet water was 1.5 uh, uh, CDs, one CD 50 pesos. Kenke price was 2.80. Uh, fish price was 4.20. Okay, this is the year. Okay. Come 2013, price of sachet water increases to 1.75, uh, Kenke 2.85, and then fish 4.35. And then come 2014, uh, King Sasha increases to 2.10, and then uh, King K 3.05, and fish 4.38. You see, it's, it's like forward ever, backward never. Okay, so as prices are increasing, uh, the tendency that going to the future to increase is very likely, particularly for developing countries. So you, you, you leave Ghana for a year, you come back and prices have changed so drastically. Certain developed countries, you don't see these huge price changes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so that is the general idea uh, here. So this is the 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 prices across the different. How do we then compute from this the index? Um, so let me minimize. Let me. All right, so let's compute the index for each year. Remember the cost of the basket for a typical household. Uh, sachet water, six. Okay, so the cost of the basket for a household. Uh, in 2012, the price was 1.5, six units are purchased. King Kate, three uh, balls are bought, and this price 2.8. Fish, the fish price is 4.2. Typical household consumes five. Okay, the market basket, the cost of the typical basket for 2014, uh, 2012 is 38.40, okay? So we do the same thing for 2013. The price level have increased from such a water from 1.50 to 1.75 times six uh, for a typical consumer, 2.85 for Kenke times three, for a typical consumer, 4.35, fish times five, that will give 40.80. So the basket price, the cost of the basket in 2013 has increased from 38.40 to 40.80. Okay. This is where the market women who are very experienced in this <laughs> inflation will say things are very are getting hard. Okay. Okay. Because they're comparing the basket of things they consume, a typical consumer purchase,
the special water is 2.10, six is purchased. KNK 2.3.053 is purchased. It took me out. I hope you guys can hear now. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So as I said, these are the prices. <clears throat> and then you compute the cost based on the units the average consumer will purchase. Okay. So the cost for 2013, as I said, will give us 40.8. This is the price of sachet times the quantity that the average consumer will purchase. 2.85 times three, and the average quantity of consumer purchase, 4.35 times five. And that will give you, if you sum that up, that will give you 40.8. And if you go to 2014, you have 2.10 uh, for the price of such a six units purchased. So that it goes down. Um, fish, 4.38 and five is purchased. The, bucket, uh, the basket cost is 43.65. So that stops the second step. So that uh, deals with the second step. Fix the baskets. So we fix the basket, the items that per car consumer will purchase. Find the prices. We've done that. We found the prices. Compute the cost of the basket we have. So that is the cost of the basket. And then using the base year, choose the base year and compute the index. Okay. So in this example, we are choosing 2012 as the base year. Okay. So we choose 2012 as the base year. How do we get the CPI for 2012? The CPI for 2012 is the CPI typically uh, is obtained by dividing the cost of the basket by the cost of the basket in the base year. So you divide the cost of the basket in any year by the cost in a base year. So doing that for the base year itself is like dividing the cost of the basket by itself. Okay. So you are normalizing it. You are normalizing, you are making 2012 the base year. Meaning 38.40 30, divided by 38.40 times 100, which it gives you 100 because you normalize it. Okay. Come 2013, you divide the cost of the basket by the cost of the basket in the base year, which is 2012. So you are going to get 40.80 divided by 38.4 times 100. That puts the, bus the CPI for 2013 at 106.25. Okay. 2014, a similar thing is done, 43.65 divided by 38.40. That gives us a CPI of 113.67. From this calculated CPI, the differences then can will help uh, will give you the extent to which the price level is changing or increasing. So CPI 2014 minus CPI 2013 will give you the year on year uh, inflation. Okay, so you can compute the year on year inflation using the CPIs that have been calculated. So you basically go back to the mother equation for CPI. I said mother equation, somebody argued, so the further equation. <laughs> CPI T minus CPI T minus one. So you like it one year or one period divided by CPI T minus one. So that gives you the inflation rate for that year. Okay. So that is the, uh, the steps that we go through to get the CPI. Take your time, go through it, and it's pretty straightforward. Fix the basket, find the prices of the basket, compute the price of the basket, choose the base here, compute the index. Okay. What are some of the problems in measuring the cost of living? Okay. Uh, if you think of the CPI, the CPI says the price of KNK and other things, right? But if KNK price increases, just go back. If KNK price increases to 3.05, um, it doesn't mean that I will purchase it at 3.05. Maybe I'll substitute, I'll find a substitute for KNK. I don't know what a substitute for KNK is. Probably you guys know. <laughs> Maybe I'll find something else. 
that has a moderate uh, price change. Okay. Somebody says Banku is a substitute for KK. I don't know. For some people, there's no substitute. It's a monopoly. <laughs> okay, so substitution bias here yeah, is as saying that, okay, you have fixed the basket, but it doesn't mean that if fuel prices are so high, I'm going to spend so much on it. Okay, I'll substitute, I'll move to other cheaper options. So when some prices change more than others, uh, when relative prices change, consumers respond by changing the market basket. Okay, so I'll change the things I consume, but in calculating the, uh, the inflation, we have fixed the basket as if I cannot change. Okay, so if I can change to a lower cost product, then you'll be overestimating the cost of living using inflation. Okay, so you'll be overestimating it because you think that I'm struggling, but I'm not struggling per se because I've moved from the products that are in the basket to cheaper products. It just means being that my well being has fallen, but uh, these are the effects. The fact that you fix the baskets doesn't capture the likelihood that people will move to other products. Uh, so they may, they may replace expensive goods that are in the basket with cheaper goods okay, at home, but you have already fixed the basket at the national level. So if you do that, CPI store keeps the basket constant and may overestimate or may overstate the cost of living. So problems in measuring of cost of living using inflation. It also takes time for it to capture new goods. Okay, so if there are new goods in the market, um, because the market basket is fixed, maybe 2012 is the base year, 2013 is the base year, that if new products come into the market, it takes time for them to get into the basket. Okay. They will still be using pepsodent price in the basket, whilst you can use, people use alternatives in the market. Okay. So variety for consumers, which is not accounted by the CPI, if there are other varieties. And every day, day in, day out, Chinese products are coming in, Indian products. So if they are not in your original basket, people are buying them, but you are ever estimating the actual inflation in the in the economy. Okay, um, so that is one. The second point: substitution bias is there. Introduction of new goods on measure changes in quality. So even if you put the kenke in the basket as the kenke, maybe over time the quality of kenke has improved, and that is why prices are increasing, right? But you are not capturing the quality changes. You are just capturing the quantity that people have bought and the costs. So quality of goods and services may rise or fall. Lower quality means value is down and vice versa. CPI does not account for quality changes. Okay. Somebody told me that uh, as for Kenke, the, the price can even remain the same, but every day or every week you go, the size will be shrinking. <laughs> Okay, so that is the change. The change is not taking place at the price level. But if the size shrinks to a point, you have no choice by buying two. Okay, so that is, it's, it's not captured. Okay, just say a ball of kinky, but it's not captured. All right, any question? Any question to this point? Yes, Anne and Beta. I want, good morning. I wanted to know, ask you, sorry. I wanted to ask why is not included? Like, is it that that's how it's supposed to be or there's a shortcoming somewhere? Like, why isn't it included? Why is the, when the, when the quality of a certain good increases, why doesn't it reflect when you are, you can you can you can you can try that but it's going to be very cumbersome because the qualities especially for setting like kinky for example the quality is not fixed mm -hmm. how do you determine the quality of kinky like what is quality kinky mm -hmm. <laughs> so and it's not fixed it's not fixed even the, for the same seller today it's hard tomorrow it's soft right. know, so so it's very difficult to capture changes in that mm -hmm. uh, and account for the, these are the, some of the challenges we have Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, an aspect of inflation that we can also keep in mind is the differences between 
something we call headline inflation and core inflation. And this, for particular, for election years, for example, you see that one per person is throwing out the numbers, or oh, the inflation is this, but, uh, and the other person is throwing out a different number and they are arguing on radio for hours, okay? Sometimes you spend the whole year arguing about things that <laughs> just wasting our time, our life. Okay, so it's important that you differentiate this and you use the right uh, terminologies uh, to make in terms of policy and also um, uh, for if you're a CEO to understand which aspect of inflation will have consequences for your business okay, or severe consequences for your business. Yes, uh, rightly so, quality is very subjective. Okay. All right, so core versus headline. When inflation is calculated by counting all the items in the consumer baskets in the CPI, all the things that we use to come compute the CPI. Then we have headline inflation. So headline inflation is the standard inflation that we are calculating, everything in the basket. Okay. And that is what we have as headline inflation. It generally recognizes that prices of some items are more volatile than others. There are certain things in the basket, they, they are just changing rapidly. Okay. And they may be changing the inflation rate, inflation rate. But if you control for those things, the other items in the basket may not be changing so much. Okay. So just to give you an idea of how, what is driving uh, the higher headline inflation. So, so here, um, prices of goods and food and energy are known to be very volatile. Energy prices, food prices at their pump, every day is changing so rapidly. Food day in and day out, okay? Uh, even porridge. <laughs> porridge is changing so much every day. Yesterday, the Porridge seller in my area explained the economics behind it to me, saying that oh, it's not easy. The, the input cost has really increased. <laughs> so the, 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 I always order this whole uh, bucket for a month. And he said, no, now he has to charge extra. So he's using economics. And I appreciated that. So I didn't argue, I didn't bargain. So, so that is the idea. It's, Food prices and energy prices are constantly changing so rapidly. So if you calculate inflation uh, by taking out, excluding the price of food and energy, the value you get will be, is referred to as core inflation. So core inflation refers to inflation calculated excluding the prices of food items and energy items in the basket. Okay. So just to have a sense of what is driving inflation? Is it food or energy? Sometimes it may even be things that you never thought of, like educational inflation, like textbooks, tuition fees. They may be increasing so rapidly and they may change the cost of the basket. Okay. Any question? I saw a hand. Um, uh, Beta, is it from the old or anyone? No, it's a new one. I wanted to ask, is he, um in countries like America, they have food, you know, before I ask that question, is it right to um, compare a developing country to a developed country? Because countries like America, their food um, prices are not as high as you see it in Ghana. You, you can get variety of food for um, a dollar or two dollars or something but it's not the same when it comes to Ghana. But we see Ghana being um, compared to countries like that. So we, with the changes that you mentioned that included food and I think you said fuel prices or something, is it right if, does that mean with America, their inflation, that's not, like the food is not accounted or is accounted for. I don't know if you get what I'm trying to ask. Because with this, their food is very, I mean, it's affordable compared to the way Ghana, our food is. Mm. So I was asking if it's right to see you can compare Ghana with any developed country. Because that. usually that's what happens. Um, yeah. So it's, yeah, people will compare because people like to compare. Um, so yeah, so things are cheaper here than here, even within the region. 
people compare Ashanti, Accra, rent in Accra is insane. <laughs> so I'm comparing, right? So, so people always compare. Um, it, the concept is the same. It's the idea that how is the cost of living in Ghana changing rapidly compared to the cost of living somewhere else? Okay. And then what policies can we as a country put in place so that the cost of the basket doesn't increase so astronomically? So people will still compare. Yes, I agree with you. If you go to the $1 shops in the US, it's still a dollar. Okay, McDonald's price don't change so rapidly. So, so yes. Uh, but then when you come here, the prices are changing so rapidly. And it's just, since you guys did the demand side and the supply side shocks, uh, changes in demand, changes in supply, you can understand why prices can increase and decrease in certain countries, okay? So if you have periods where there are lots of droughts in a country, prices will increase. There's a supply side shock, okay? Uh -huh. And if people are demanding so much of the product in your country, prices will increase also. So both supply and demand side shocks, if the shocks are so rampant in an economy, yes, firms, the cost of doing business rises so rapidly in Ghana, they will try to pass on the prices to consumers. Yes. So these are some of the things that we have to put in place at the policy level to kind of stabilize prices so that the average person in Ghana will be okay. I, I, I agree with you. I travel when I go, I'm like, but chicken was, Three euros some years ago, and it's still exactly. three euros. <laughs> mm. So, so these are some of the issues. And here, uh, the chicken last Christmas will be different next Christmas. Uh -huh. So, input costs, the feeding, and all that. Even ask for egg price. Uh, you see, yeah. that has changed. It has changed so rapidly. So, these are some of the issues. Yeah, but comparison, yeah, that's what we do. And it's a good comparison so that we can do something about our system. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, food prices, maybe yeah, somebody's saying food prices are low. Yeah, food prices relative to somewhere may be low, but then the rate of change may be higher. Okay. And the income levels are lower also, significantly lower here. So these are some of it. So that's why we are not comparing the absolute money that you are using to buy by the rate of change in that. Okay. All right, let me move on. I have quite a lot to do. All right, levels of inflation. In general, single-digit inflation is considered low inflation. So when you have single-digit inflation, you consider that as low inflation. So 8% inflation, 9% inflation, and governments are always struggling to, to attain a single-digit inflation. Okay. And last week, if you were in class, I mentioned the implication of high inflation for uh, nominal interest rates. So high inflation environment, interest rates are going to be very high so it makes sense that governments try to push for single digits. It's not all the time that they are able to realize that you need to put in strong policies to achieve this level of the single digits. So low is inflation. Low inflation is predictable. I, I explained that also. When you begin to have like 2% inflation, 3% inflation, when people are giving out a loan, they know that for Ghana, it will be around 2%. Okay, to not be so much high, it's predictable. However, if inflation begins to rise, okay, it's 16%, the next year, 18%, next year, 20%, 25%. There is no way I will predict a low inflation when it's rising. Okay. So typically when inflation begins to rise in the economy, people begin to expect even much higher inflation. Whilst if inflation begins to trend down, people expect lower inflation because they understand the policies that you're putting in place will lead to a lower inflation, okay? So it's not surprising. Zimbabwe got into that road of higher inflation, double digits, and that was it, okay? So, uh, and generally desirable for economies, as I said, low inflation is desirable for economies. Inflation rate is said to be galloping if it's in the double and triple digits, okay? You don't want to find yourself in tri triple digit inflation. Inflation rates above thousand percent are called hyperinflation. So you buy the bread in the morning, by midday, the price has tripled. <laughs> okay. You don't want to live in that economy. Okay, Venezuela also had a similar case a year or two years ago. Prices were increasing so much that they began to use the US currency. Okay. Zimbabwe also did the same. 
So that is, these are some of the things. Anticipated versus unanticipated inflation. Uh, we say that anticipated inflation is not so much of a big deal. If I anticipate that inflation will be 10%, and therefore, if I'm giving a loan at just for 10% and it actually is realized, then that's, that is not a problem because I have given you the loan already factoring that into it. Okay. Unanticipated is the case where I anticipate a 10% inflation, give you a loan at 15% because I want to make a 5% profit. And then come end of year, the inflation, at the point of you paying me back, inflation rate itself is 20%. I have lost. Okay, so the key issue here is whether or not you can anticipate inflation. And that is what a lot of banks are doing, finding analysts who will analyze the optimal inflation rate they should use for calculating their interest rates. Okay, and if you high, if you are just too high, nobody will borrow from you. And if you are just too low and there is high unanticipated inflation, then you lose. Okay, so economic agents tend to form an expectation about the rate of inflation. Uh, on anticipated inflation is the inflation rate that is expected, that you are expecting, and one that if it's realized, then you, you are good. On anticipated inflation occurs when inflation rate deviates from expectation. We are all expecting 10%, but it's 15%. It's deviation. The borrower, uh, the, 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 the lender will lose in that sense okay, if the inflation rate is higher than anticipated then the lender will lose. However, if the anticipate, we are anticipating a 10% inflation, and therefore I give you a loan at 15%, expecting a profit of 5%. And inflation rate happens to be 5% itself. But I was expecting 15. Then I'm making a profit of 10%. So the, borrow, uh, the, the, the borrower will lose when inflation is below expectation, okay? Because if it's below expectation, I'm expecting 10 and therefore I was charging you higher interest, but the realized inflation is lower. Then the person giving you the money has already charged you the 15%. So he will gain. Okay. So, but in our cases, the anticipated are usually on the higher side. Okay. And that is where banks are a bit edgy to reduce rates because they know that uh, if they reduce the rates too low, Inflation rate high, inflation rate is double digits. Why would I, if it's inflation rate is 15%, why would I give you a loan at 15%? Then it's all going to defray just inflation, okay? The cost of inflation. So unanticipated inflation is also referred to as surprise inflation. Okay. This is not a good surprise. <laughs> okay, so for example, if economic agents expect the inflation rate to be 8% for next month, and the actual inflation turns out to be 10%, then there is a 2% unanticipated inflation. Hmm. All right, causes and measure, causes and types of inflation. What are the causes? Uh, let me go through. Uh, cost push inflation, so the cost side, okay. So you can have cost push inflation, inflation that is caused by higher costs. <laughs> it's a literal, a literal translation, okay? Cost push, cost is pushing prices up. And you can already think that these are the cost of production, okay? On the supply side shocks. Firms, the production costs are just doubled. So firms are passing on the higher prices to consumers, it's cost push inflation. Economists identify two categories of shocks that give rise to inflation. Shocks to aggregate demand, so demand for goods and services, if there are shocks there, and shocks to aggregate supply. So supply side shocks and demand side shocks. Okay. Cost push inflation refers to aggregate supply side or supply induced inflation. Okay. Inflation that is driven by higher supply higher uh, prices due to supply shocks. Firms are not producing a lot, so it pushes price up, or firms are actually increasing price. <laughs> okay. Um, they result from, <clears throat> as I said, shocks to rising production costs. 
and that shifts the aggregate supply curve. Okay, so by now you should know if there's a supply shock that reduces supply, then they said the supply curve will shift to the left. And if there's a supply shock that increases supply, then it will increase output to the right. Okay, so I'm forgetting the lady who was asking the question. If firms are producing a lot, like bumper harvest, then prices will fall. Okay. So in the US, there are a lot of firms and they are producing so many products that are competing. Okay. McDonald's, KFC, Arby's, all these chains, there are so many of them that you cannot be reducing price. They are supplying a lot. So it's not surprising that prices will remain constant. Okay. So these are some of the things. So uh, the result from shocks due to pr rising production costs. If the production cost for the feed makers in the US also rises, it will, a similar thing will happen. But you see that their system, even when the farmers are having higher production costs, the government will come in and subsidize. Okay, yeah, they will just go to WTO and say that oh, uh, they are subsidizing research. <laughs> subsidizing research for farmers, but then it's reducing the cost of production for their farmers, and therefore they cannot, uh, it stabilizes the prices. So food prices will remain um, the same. We cannot afford to subsidize farmers, food production. So the pass through effects is very high. Okay. All right. So as I said, the result from shocks due to production costs, changes in production costs. Uh, in summary, cost push inflation results from the rising cost due to periods of high, in general, periods of high unemployment and slack resource utilization. Why do we say in periods of high uh, unemployment? When cost of production is rising, firms will begin to cut down employment. Okay? So that will result in high unemployment because they cannot afford uh, to produce at that cost. So they'll try to reduce employment and that can trigger prices to increase further because you're not employing people to produce and the few that you're producing, lots of people want the product. So prices will increase. Okay. The last component, we say slack resource utilization. When the cost of doing business rises, you may have 20 warehouse, but only one warehouse may be in operation. You have slack in resource utilization and the utilization of your resources. Okay. You can't produce to your capacity. So in very high inflation environment, uh, you, you talk to the managers, oh, I can't even supply 100,000, but if I do, the cost is so high, people can't afford. Okay. So that is um, the summary with that. Rising wages is therefore a source of cost push inflation but there are other causes. If workers are demanding higher prices, uh, higher wages, okay, or they're going on demonstration, firms will be forced to pay them higher wages, but then consumers have to pay for their higher wages, right? And if the consumers are the same workers, then you are back to square one. <laughs> you get a higher wage, but you're buying everything that double the price. Your purchasing power hasn't changed, but the price in the market has risen. So that is why sometimes um, as a government, or you have to be very careful the extent to which you double people or change increase wages in an economy. It doesn't necessarily mean that their welfare will improve. Okay. So uh, when people are going for wage bargaining, they will try to peg, peg the, the expected increase in their wage to the inflation rates so that at least it accounts for inflation. But if you increase wages way too much, we all have the doubling of our wages. We are all buying from Accra Mall. We are all going to fight over the products in the Accra Mall. Prices will increase. Okay. So rising wages is a common source of cost, pu cost push inflation, but there are other uh, sources. Okay. Um, these are some examples. The oil price shocks, increases in oil price, or uh, the OPEC countries decide to reduce output, prices will rise. Okay. So cited examples of cost push inflation. In Ghana, the triple digit inflation of the 1980s is commonly traced to the droughts and poor harvests of that year. So farmers had bad, terrible rainfall, food shortages, 
And then um, that led to uh, a lot of um, higher prices. Okay. So some, some industries, they create this artificial shortage and then that naturally increases prices. All right, demand pool inflation, uh, as the name suggests, demand is coming from a demand side shock. So it refers to aggregate demand driven inflation. And uh, this is a shift in the aggregate demand curve that induces increase in price level. What will happen to demand for prices to increase? People have to demand more for prices to increase. Okay. If people are not demanding, the price will fall. Okay. So we are demanding a lot. Uh, so prices of items, uh, especially for necessities, you'd have no choice. Okay. It occurs when aggregate demand rises more rapidly than aggregate output. When people are demanding more of a good than producers are able to produce, then it's demand side, okay? Demand side shock. Price of homes are increasing. Demand is high. People are demanding two bedroom flats. People are willing. If you stand there and say, oh, 1,500 for two bedroom or 2,000, you are not willing to pay, somebody pays, okay? Land values are rising, demand side, okay? You don't want to pay 30,000, 40,000, somebody goes and pays. <laughs> okay, so these are demand side uh, factors. One of the most important drivers of demand driven is growth in the money supply. And as I said, if people, if you increase the money supply, if people will demand more goods, okay? And therefore price will rise. If you give me, give all of us doubling of our salaries, we will demand more goods. People will want to live luxury and all that price will, will increase okay the most famous uh, monetary economist um, Milton Friedman says that inflation is always and everything a monetary phenomenon so according from him forget the cost side it's more about money it's driven by money supply okay people have more money they consume more it's demand side driven they demand more goods and services, prices rise, and it's not more about costs. Okay. In our economies, uh, developing countries can be both. Okay. Like we now announce that fuel prices are going up, it changes everything. Okay. Cost of production, uh, demand is still probably the same. We are buying, we, we, we desire to buy the our five kinky, kinkies a, a month, but now we can't uh, because of the higher cost of production, which has translated to higher prices. So Friedman's quote illustrates the notion that most of the time inflation is as a result from excessive growth in money supply over growth of output. So from him, if the central bank is pumping a lot of money, making money available to banks for banks to loan at a cheaper rate and other things. If you pump in too much money and the money is not leading to economic growth, like people are not producing output with the money that you are pumping in, but it's going straight to consumption, the prices will rise. Okay. So you want to pump in money into the economy, but you want people who get access to this money to start businesses, uh, produce exports so the economy will gain. But if there is going straight to consumption, then prices are going to rise astronomically. So when you have excess growth in money supply over growth in output, then it will lead to uh, inflation. And that is what Friedman is saying. He said most of the cases in a lot of developing countries, uh, money supply outweighs the growth. You, are pump you increase money supply by 5%, economic growth less than 1%. Everything is going straight into inflation. Okay, yeah, Lewis. Hey, hello, sir. Yes, um, go ahead. I wanted to ask about liquid injection and um, how it affects um, inflation. Yes, that's what I'm saying. That if you pump in a lot of money, it's like you increase liquidity, you increase access to funds in the economy, uh, you increase money supply by a base, which is the central bank. Uh, I think in the very last session, I'll talk about open market operations. So if the central bank puts in a lot of put in policies that increases the money, amount of money in circulation that will trigger, that can trigger higher inflation if, according to Milton, if 
the change uh, most of the time, if the, the, the growth in the money supply outweighs the growth in output, then it can go straight into inflation. And I'm saying that in practice, it means that you increase money supply a lot, but people in the economy are just borrowing the money and consuming and not producing, then it will generate inflation. Okay. But if they, they are pro taking the money and they are actually investing and they are consuming, prices will not rise. Remember, I like the I've forgotten the lady's name, Ethel or something. Supply will increase because firms are investing and producing, right? So if firms are producing and uh, supplying, supply in the economy will increase and prices will fall. But if firms are not producing, but it's all going to straight to consumption, prices will re increase further. Okay. okay um, I thought that. Okay. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Liz, uh, concerning the inflation, recently uh, we read it in the news that the government says it's not good, uh, going to increase the salary of public sector workers for the next three years. Really? I would like to three years. Yes. I didn't hear that one. Yes. And people have been uh, arguing about it. I would like to know uh, whether it's a measure to uh, control inflation, as you said. Yes. Yeah, so and then, even though the government is not going to increase the salary of public sector workers, the prices of goods and services are going higher. So, it will also make the uh, worker worse off. So I'd like to know the economic implications of that. So Thank let you. me take it from the last one. Yes, if you, you buy items, you, you earn 3,000 or 4,000 or 5,000 or even 10,000 a month, and you buy certain items, right? If the price of those items doubles, you, 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 your poverty levels will increase or your poverty level will increase just because prices have increased. Okay, so you were comfortable at 5,000, but as prices increase, you realize that the 5,000 is, is peanuts. <laughs> it doesn't solve anything. But when you got a job at 5,000, you were super excited. But now it's worth nothing because you cannot even live on it. Okay. So that is, that is one issue. And that is why, as I said, the unions always say that, okay, then adjust our wages based on the rate of change and the cumulative changes that are taking place in the economy, which is a valid point because you want to still be able to maintain your same purchasing power, okay? The second, first one as to whether the government is trying to stabilize prices and also, uh, or, or not. So that is part of it. It can be that you, I think the bottom line is that we don't have a lot of money. <laughs> We don't have a lot of money to increase the, the, the wage bill. The wage bill for public sector is very high for a developing country. So um, you don't want to increase that, okay? So that you need money, but if you increase it, fine, it can trigger higher inflation, but you also don't have the money uh, to, put, to, to do that. And therefore uh, they will want to put in measures. I don't know about the three years, but at some point they have no uh, option but to adjust. Um, I can take one. Thank you, sir. Yo, Lewis. Oh, you're welcome. Hey, hello, sir. Um, yes. Uh, some years ago, they did something like a uh, denomination change, like they say um, 10,000 is to one Ghana city. Yeah. Yes. And I want to find out the effect of that on inflation. If it's actually going to improve the economy or it's just um, a waste of time and political gimmick. Oh, you cannot say it's a waste of time. You, you have no idea. When I, I was a student in Legon, some years ago, we used to take student loan. And if you go to Circle to take your money, right, where I used to go, if I remember correctly, the amount was 1.5, okay. <laughs> 1.5 million in the early 2000, 2001, thereabout. 1.5 million, you have no idea. Everybody in Ghana, we're all millionaires. <laughs> If I go to the stand chart at the time, the, I think I forgot in my bank, Barclays, Circle Branch, and I take 1.5 million, I need a whole security detail behind me. In fact, I go with my friend so that he works behind me because it, the money is bulky, <laughs> okay? So it's not a waste of time. It's actually improved a lot of economic efficiency. You don't have to carry a bag of just 10,000, 5,000, like huge bag, the, the security risk. 
and all that. So it really improved transactions. As to whether it improved like purchase, like inflation, higher prices, I have to look at the numbers. But yeah, I don't expect it because the value will be the same. It's just that it's equated to some zeros are not taken off. And if a similar zero is taken off on the product side, then it shouldn't lead to any price increases. It shouldn't lead to any price increases. So that is, and even if you remember at that time, it was the dollar to the CD was like one to one. Okay, so about one to one. So um, it, it's not a waste of time. It just, it, it, the objective is may not be just reducing inflation, but also improving efficiency. That carrying of those money, every four, three million, uh, 300 Ghana, you're already hitting millennial status, okay. So these are this that was the advantage. Okay. Um, yeah, let me take a comment. Um, yeah. So yeah, over time, then the CD got out of hand. But if that, I think you guys should always uh, that's why I always advise you guys should avoid the politics. Okay. When it, when it comes to the economy, I always say that it doesn't matter what party you belong to when inflation is high. We all have to make sure the policies are put in place uh, that improves the well-being. It doesn't matter party A or party B. And we've taken this class, so don't make those some of those pedestrian arguments uh, because of party A or party B. If you are not producing a lot of goods and services and you are always demanding somebody's currency, your value will go down. <laughs> so uh, why do we wake up and we are surprised? I don't see where the surprise element is. <laughs> Okay. You are demanding Christmas is coming. People are demanding USD. Demand if you demand more of the item, the price level will go up. This is demand analysis, okay, or money demand. But typical demand, the more you demand uh, for a good or service, the price level will go up. And if you are going to buy toothpick and we have to demand a foreign currency, the price will go up. The value will go up. Okay, so uh, it's not surprising. You can do redenomination, but the fundamentals, the, the, the structure of the economy, it's such that we are all, we become a, a container economy, buy and sell, buy and sell. And we are not buying even from the economy, we are just import and sell, yeah. Uh, don't be surprised. Yeah, there was a hand, so let me take it quickly and move on. Yes, Mark. So, so yes. Please, uh... Initially, we are saying that we, we we are not supposed to fund farmers or something. I stand to be corrected. I didn't say that. I said we don't. We don't. We do subsidize fertilizers and other things. Uh, uh, that is what we do. Uh, okay. but I'm, I was just making the point that in a lot of developed countries, they really subsidize, uh, uh, like subsidies. I know. I. I in Canada, for example, I knew that even the wheat board will control output to control prices. Like, like I remember my grad school days, they will say that you will go and analyze the whole policy. And then they will say that, okay, looking at the output under acreage, this is the, the level of wheat they can produce. And if they manage to produce this wheat, output will rise so much that prices will fall. So what do they do? They control output. They give every farmer a quota that you can produce. So if you have land that can produce, if you have 10 acres that you want to produce, you can get a quota for only five acres. Because if you plant all the 10 acres, output will increase and prices will fall. So you are given a quota for five acres. Government can design a compensation system for you for the other five acres. You are not growing it, but you are getting money for it. That's why farmers are rich, super rich uh, there. Like children coming from farming households are rich. They don't take student loans, <laughs> okay? But they, they get a lot of subsidies. Their land values are high and all that. So that's what I mean by subsidies. We will subsidize a bit fertilizers and other things, but you will not do this kind of uh, subsidies, okay? The second one is in connection with, no, we did read the read denomination and can you lift your voice? I can hardly hear you. Hey, sir, I was talking about the red denomination. Yes, no, go ahead. We did it to improve efficiency. Can we say that the, the structure or 
the laws back in it couldn't work to the optimal because there were certain commodities which which had an increase in prices like let's say water we were, we were buying water at i think five pesos or ten pesos but you you go and they tell you we you don't have change okay so I see what they, you mean. they have to yes so yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so. it could it could i i don't know um it could maybe at the lower level yes i remember trotro drivers was it will be saying they don't have change if you remember even additional coins had to be uh uh they had to come up with the additional coins because they realized that the at the lower level the peswa level it was people are struggling to have change so it could but i don't know the magnitude of that on driving prices i can't tell i can't tell the magnitude of that on driving prices so we have to look at the, the, the data. So the data, the inflation rate um, before the redenomination and the inflation rates after redenomination to see whether it's driven by, by redenomination. Yeah, somebody says it did, yeah. Why do consumers and businesses hate inflation the way they do? I think by now it should be much clearer to you. It makes cost of living um, production very high. And government spends so much resources and energy trying to fight inflation. So you have to put in policies, mark monetary policy, fiscal policies to try to curb uh, higher prices. Okay. So inflation poses a non-trivial cost on all of us as firms, as individuals. We are impacted some way by the cost of uh, things in the economy, the cost of inflation. So the cost of inflation, as I said, inflation poses a non-trivial cost on all of us. However, the cost of inflation depends on whether it is anticipated or unanticipated, okay? Somebody was marking my screen. Uh, okay. Um, inflation, as I said, if it's unanticipated, then the cost is higher and, than if it's anticipated. Inflation is anticipated when it is consistent with expectation. That is when actual inflation does not deviate substantially from expected inflation. If that is the case, then the cost is not so much because I can anticipate it and adjust my lending and my behavior. Okay. When all inflation is anticipated, economic agents are able to plan on the inflation and its expected, ten, its expected effect tends to be very small, very minimal. Lenders can accurately incorporate expected inflation into their nominal interest rates, okay? If you can anticipate it. The main cause of, uh, of uh, inflation, the main cause of anticipated inflation, if you can predict, is the menu and shoe leather costs, okay? So menu and shoe leather costs uh, will be the, 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 the main cost of, of, of inflation. Uh, what do we mean by menu and shoe leather costs? They are not complicated. If I can anticipate that, if I live in a high inflation environment, a lot of my money will be in investments, right? I will not, I will not hold on to money. I will not have 10,000 Ghana cities sitting at home. No way. Because the 10,000 Ghana city will, be val will, be, uh, will lose value in the next few months in a very high inflation environment. So people will have a lot of money in investment that, even if they have to go and buy water, they need to go to the ATM to withdraw, okay? So the transaction from the bank on from, uh, yeah, will be very high, okay? So sweet leather cost of inflation simply is saying that because money loses its value during inflation, individuals tend to hold less money during periods of high inflation and are forced to make more visits to the bank for a drawer. So your transport costs, the transaction costs going to the bank forth and back and all that uh, will increase. Uh, that is the cost that people will face if it's anticipated. Okay. And that is why we are calling it shoe leather costs. Your, your tra transaction costs will be very high. The increased cost of frequent withdrawals is the shoe leather costs. Inflation forces producers um, to continuously uh, uh, change prices. Okay. If I run a supermarket and cost of doing business is rising every day 
Every day I'll be changing the price tags okay, on the item. Okay. Hiring people to, to go through the supermarket and be switching, changing tags, okay? So if it's anticipated, if I anticipate that inflation is going to increase next month, I have to begin to prepare my tax for a change. Okay. So the, uh, the, the price, the print more price tax and catalogs when inflation uh, changes continuously. This is the menu cost associated with anticipated. So if I anticipate inflation as a businessman, I can plan for it. Okay. As a person, I can plan for that. Now it will change my investment behavior and then the supermarkets to change their pricing it's just that they will incur some costs always changing prices okay. the cost of unanticipated inflation the real deal as i said is the cost of unanticipated inflation in an economy so unanticipated inflation the surprise element of inflation is the most costly okay than uh most costly compared to anticipated okay and uh, as I said, it redistributes income. Inflation redistributes real income from lenders to borrowers. So the scenario I was giving you, higher inflation than expected. Uh, the unexpected part of it is higher inflation than expected. Uh, then the lender is, giving, is losing money. And if it's lower, the borrower is losing money. So there is uh, redistribution of wealth between the lender and the borrower. A borrower will be very happy. <laughs> If uh, somebody said that if I'm borrowing the money right now, the rate will charge me, but I borrowed it last year and it was a cheaper rate okay, because of the cost of inf uh, the inflationary rate in the economy. Inflation also reduces the raw income of recipient of fixed income. If you receive a fixed income in a high inflation environment, you become poor over, over, over time. Okay, your income is fixed. And that was the point that some a lady was making. The income is fixed, but the price are increasing you become worse off. Your 10,000 will be meaningless in a high inflation environment over time, okay? And then people will be asking for 100,000 Ghana cities salary a month, okay? And, but the things you buy is the same. The same things of uh, Milo, Kant, and Ideal Milk you buy, okay? It's same, but you have just higher, a lot of money. So a lot of money buying uh, same amount, but at a higher price, okay? So managing an economy is not a it's not a it's not a joke. Okay. If you don't manage it well and prices are doubling and you are so naive and you keep on pumping so much money, doubling everybody's salary, their salary will increase, but their well-being will not necessarily increase. Okay. So you try to put in policies that will increase supply of goods and services, push prices down, and then if you don't pay them so much, you're okay. Let me give you a scenario. If you go to like the US, for example, the wages are very high, very, very high. So people are making $70,000, $80,000, $100,000, $150,000 a year. Okay. If you come to Europe, Germany, or any other country, income levels are not that high, even at the same level. Okay. As assistant professor, associate professor, it's not that high. But the price of goods are very cheap. Okay. Things are not so expensive. The things that you buy with your 100,000 in the US will be the same as the things that you buy with your 30,000 euros in Europe, okay? So you are not getting so much money, but you don't have to spend so much on rent. Like rent in Europe is not as expensive as you pay in New York for. So these are some of the things that uh, you consider. How much money am I making in Accra? How, what, what is the cost of living in Accra? compared to how much money I'm making in Kumasi, what is the cost of living in Kumasi? It does not necessarily mean that higher salaries will translate to higher well-being. Okay? If other constraints, other things are relaxed, okay? if prices are changing, if uh, things in the economy are changing rapidly, you may have higher prices, but it may not necessarily mean that you can consume more or you can take a holiday or you can enjoy life. You know? So these are so you have to manage the economy in such a way that even if, if people have lower wages, the cost of living is not so high. But if people have lower cost of, uh, lower wages and the cost of living is very high and it's changing rapidly, then you have this uh, uh, uncertainty in the economy. People become jittery and start instability, de demonstration strikes, and it can lead to even overthrow. Inflation can cause overthrow. 
of a, of a government. People become fed up okay, with the higher prices. So it's important that you manage uh, these things very well. All right, any question? Then I can end the inflation part. Okay, let's go on. All right, unemployment, another macro level indicator, uh, the level of unemployment in the country. Okay. Understanding the labor force is a critical step for understanding the measurement of unemployment. We all already know that if firms are not producing a lot of goods and services, it can trigger high levels of unemployment. Okay. If we are not producing goods and services in this country, where are you guys going to find jobs? Or how are we, we all going to find jobs? Because you're not producing the goods and services. Then firms don't need the, uh, the workers. They don't need, uh, if nobody is producing anything and nobody's sending his money to the bank, why will a bank, why will somebody hire a cashier at the, at the bank? Okay. But he, as the Vietnam and the Thailand people have been successful using rice, the exporting rice, large quantities, the companies they have, accountants, finance people. So demand for workers is high. Okay. But then it's because our preference for all the nice scented rice is very high. Okay. And then we, we say that ours is not good. Okay. So the rice farmer here doesn't, cannot even break even for him to hire an accountant. Because he's not receiving so much money. He's not involved in any input transaction. It's too small, it cannot expand. Okay. So then uh we are all complaining that there are no jobs but the jobs are has to come from the private sector okay it's okay you cannot do, rely as a country on public sector to solve the unemployment problem yes the asian tigers they are making they are producing everything In malaysia and all this they are producing for their economy okay so that's the only way you have to do that yeah netam francis Please come, you're, you're muted. Please come in and let me. So sorry, it, it, it's a mistake. It's a mistake, okay. All right, so understanding the labor force. The labor force is a critical step for understanding the measurement of unemployment, okay? The labor force for any country is made up of the employed and the unemployed. Okay, the labor force for Ghana will be the employed, people who are employed, they are in the labor force, and those who are unemployed are also in the labor force, okay? However, the Employed are those who work for, so the employed are those who work for pay, but includes those temporarily also absent from work due to illness. So if I'm sick and I didn't come to work, it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm unemployed, okay? I'm just for a short time, or if I'm on leave, it doesn't mean that I am unemployed. So that is it. Okay, so the employed are those who work for pay, but includes those absent from work due to uh, illness and uh, leave, okay? Uh, the unemployed refers to those who are not employed, so you, but they are actively looking for work. So if you're actively looking for work, but you don't have a job, then you're unemployed. But if you, are on, if you don't have a job, but you're not actively looking, by the strict definition of unemployment, you are not unemployed you should be actively seeking work okay so the statistical service or carry out surveys like the census and uh, living standard service and interview people and ask them about their labor market condition there's a model called labor force section unit so labor market section where they ask people in the past one week or the past two weeks have you worked uh if you haven't worked have you actively seeked work okay so that we count you as part of the unemployed but if you are not actively seeking work then you are not part of it strictly part of the unemployed but i always advise policymakers that that indicator can be very small saying that oh the people who are unemployed is just five percent but there may be a lot of people who are just actively not seeking work because they are fed up okay so you may have to broaden the indicator so that you have a good sense of uh uh, you have a good sense of what is going on in the in the economy. All right, so the unemployed refers to those who are not employed but are actively looking for work. And uh, this refers to those 
who have made specific efforts to find work in a defined uh, environment, the defined period. So, yeah, as I said, the discouraged workers are not necessarily part of the uh, the the unemployed. Akusia. Okay, so discouraged workers are people without employment uh, who have given up in the search for employment. They are people who have searched for jobs for long periods without success and have given up on the job search. Discouraged workers are not strictly part of the labor force and therefore are not counted as unemployed. And that is why you, when the unemployment data is reported, people are, but we, are, we all don't have jobs, but you say the unemployment rate is 4%, 5%. Yeah, a lot of people will say, oh, I've given up, I'm not even looking. So you are not counted as part of the labor force. And you are not counted as part of the unemployed. And if you are not part of the unemployed and you are also not employed, then you are not part of the labor force. Okay, so the unemployment rate, therefore, will be what? The unemployment rate is the fraction of the labor force that is unemployed. So the unemployment rate is the unemployed divided by the labor force. Okay. The number of people who are unemployed divided by the number of people who are in the labor force. But you know that the labor force is made up of the unemployed and the employed. So the total, so the proportion of the labor force without a job, but actively seeking work. So that is it, um, the unemployment rate. Uh, so you can, Look at different examples of this. Consider a country that has a recent population, uh, current population of 41.7 million. Labor force market statistics for this country shows that 29.68 million are currently employed. Okay. And 24.9 million people are unemployed. So you can easily calculate the labor force participation rate, the number of people in this country that are in the labor force. Okay, so 22.49 million people are unemployed. Okay. Children will not be part of the labor force, right? So they, they will not be actively seeking work. So you know you will think add them. So as I said, the size of this country's labor force is 29.68 plus 2.49. That gives you 32.17 million people who are in the labor force. This number constitutes 77.1% um, of the population. So the labor force participation rate here, the labor force participation rate is the number of people in the labor force divided by the number of the population. Okay. However, the unemployment rate is not divided by the population, but divided by, <clears throat> by the labor force. The unemployment rate is unemployed divided by the labor force and not by the population. Labor force divided by the population is the labor force participation rate. So the participation rate uh, is 77.15%. Okay. You can compute the, uh, the unemployment rate from this. Okay, so you have the number of unemployed people uh, divided by the labor force that you have. Okay. So that will give you that. Okay. So the labor force participation rate is 70 days. The unemployment rate is the 2.49 divided by the 32 million people who are in the labor force. So the unemployment rate is 7.74, while the labor force participation rate is 77.15. Any question? Yes, go ahead, uh, Francis. Um, sir, many a time there are some people, they are being employed seasonally. Yes. Like those people who sell mangoes. Sometimes when the season is yeah. over, then they become unemployed. Yeah. Sometimes too, when you pick these uh, keys, they normally drive the Pragya vehicle and they are under age. Some of them are 15, 14 years. And some of the students doing Kaye in Accra, maybe some of them are 14, 15 years too. And you said with the labor force, okay, keys are not 
included, but sometimes yeah. they are taking the active labor force. I want yes, to so you have to be in the uh, working age bracket uh, to be able to be counted. I think it's 17 and above or 18 and above to be counted as uh, being part of the labor force. Children of that age are also supposed to be in school. So using that strict measure, you will not count them as part of the labor force. You can, it's, it's child labor if you count them. And, and ILO will come after you. Because you sign all these conventions regarding labor, okay? And if you go strictly by these indicators, trust me, um, trust me, uh, I've had this argument with so many of my friends, uh, the World Bank, we always argue. And then they, they will always say, but Edward, we have to use the strict measure because otherwise you can't compare. I'm like, if you go by this indicator, then some of us, all of us have been Taliban before. <laughs> you know, if your mother sells oranges, I'm sure weekends you have to help. Okay. So these are the things. They, they are a bit of differences uh, in that. And then now they, they try to qualify it doing an activity beyond a certain hour, number of hours and not carrying a certain level of weight. Uh, but children strictly, we don't count them as part of the labor force. Okay. So, so this country, there's a lot of people who are in that group. Children will not be a part of it. Okay. So we don't, we don't. I know that yes, KIAs and all this. Farm hands, you go to the farm, young people are there and all that. So. The, it's Charlie, but and cocoa, for example, um, if now people are not buying cocoa from countries where they use child labor to, to produce them. So there's a lot of certification going on in the cocoa, UTZ, all manner of certification now going on just to restrict uh, children in the supply chain. Um, Okay. The other one okay. you didn't answer. They, they, I mean, some people they work within a particular season. Like today, you see them yeah. in the active labor force, yeah. and some two months or two weeks to come, they yeah. are out of work. They don't have any work. How will you classify? Yeah, I'm this? coming to the different types of unemployment. So, the um, seasonal, there are people seasonality. Like during periods where they good rain, they are, they have a job, and then periods where uh, there's drought, they don't have a job, so they go through a lot of seasonality. I'll touch on that when I come to types of unemployment. Okay, When I, I go into types of unemployment, I can go into that. So we still try to capture that. Maybe the guy has a job, there's everybody, seasonality, he knows that this season to this season, I, I have a job. This season to this season, I, have of, of, I don't have a job. And it's even very common in Europe and North America that people know that the factory is running 10 months in a year two months you go on holiday so when a guy the guy works like crazy for 10 months save up his money take his money move to mexico or cancun somewhere and enjoy life <laughs> he knows that there is a season where he work hard uh, double shifts 12 16 hours a day but then there's two months where he's off or those who are doing this Afforestation projects, uh, planting trees during certain periods. Okay, so these are our seasonal jobs. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on those seasonality uh, in the, in a GFE. Okay, um, unemployment spell and duration. There are certain times you you have you don't have a job for a short time, and then you get a job again, so you can go through unemployment spells. Even within a year, somebody can gain a, get have a job, lose a job. So, so the period of time or times that an, an unemployed person remains continuously unemployed is called an unemployment spell. So how long you, if you have an unemployment spell, it means that there's a, there was a period of time that you didn't have a job, but then you got a job. So your spell may be like four months without a job. Somebody's spell can be like a year without a job. Another person, they are actively seeking work, but then another person is like two years they haven't found a job after losing the, fir the first one. Okay. And then if, if this was a labor market class, which I teach at level 400, then I'll go into like the strategies you have to do, put in place to minimize the spell or the, 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 the duration. Okay. So for example, an individual who starts the year with a job, but loses it around March, finds a new one in June, holds on to it until October, 
when he loses that job for and remains unemployed until the end of the year will have like two spells of unemployment. Okay. As for this person, he has to go to church and pray. <laughs> okay. Okay. He has to go and pray. Hmm. Uh, having uh, obtaining a, having a job, um, you start a new year with a job, you lose it around March, finds a new one in June, holds it on to it until October. Yeah, the guy needs a lot of prayers. Okay, so these are some of the things. So you have to yeah you have it's, you have to go into a lot of strategies to keep jobs and also. The way the world is going, you need a backup. You need to start here, like with your own small something on the side. So that uh, if you lose your main, the other job, you can, there's something that holds you up till you get something. Okay. Uh, it's, it's becoming very clear that one job does, it will not cut it. Okay. So don't be very con uh, content with, with that job, trying to save up your pensions and other things. You can start a small business on the side employ people too, then the unemployment is coming down. Okay. So the length of time an unemployed uh, employment spell lasts is called the duration of that spell. Okay. So you had like two spells of unemployment, but in each case, the first one was shorter than the second one. Okay. So one, one was quite long. It took you a year to find a job. Okay. And there are a lot of people like that. So many people that you find that they are asking for help. Okay. Types of unemployment. Um, uh, three key main types. There are three main types of unemployment. We have frictional unemployment. We have structural unemployment. And then we have cyclical unemployment. Okay. Um, the distinction between these types of unemployment is useful for understanding the causes, and then importantly, the policies that we will put in place. Each type of unemployment desire and requires different policies or different policy. Okay, you cannot have one policy to address all. So it depends on the problem the country has. Is it structural? Is it frictional? Is it cyclical? And the solutions are different. Okay. So frictional unemployment is the unemployment that results from constant movement movement of workers between jobs okay at every point in time some workers are changing jobs and locations so frictional is not a big deal because you are changing jobs you are looking for a better job okay uh, in europe i have friends who say that oh the labor I, I got a job but i don't like the salary i'm like okay it's frictional because he's just searching okay he's searching for a better job in Ghana, you don't have that luxury. Whatever you get, you take you take it. <laughs> and then once you are working, you look for it, another option. But in their economies, they can afford that. Say. So at any point in time, under frictional unemployment, uh, people are constantly searching for jobs. They, they even have jobs, but they are looking for better ones. Okay. Since people, do, because there are a lot of jobs, it's just the matching. Okay. So since people do not always work from one job to another, some people will be unemployed for a short period. Okay. Frictional unemployment cannot be reduced to zero in any economy. So in any economy, there will be people who are searching, who are even moving jobs. Okay. Even if the economy is at full employment, the economy is at full employment if, depending on our resources, we are able to produce at our maximum. Okay. So the unemployment rate that is left after we have been able to reach our maximum it's called the, uh, the full employment. So even if Ghana was very efficient in producing the highest output that will absorb a lot of people, maybe there will still be some unemployment around 5%. Okay. So that will be our full employment level. Even at full employment, the, the maximum we can get to is 90, 95% employment. There will still be 5%, those who are in the short term looking for better jobs and all that. Okay. So there will be some frictional unemployment in the economy. It is a type of voluntary form of employment. People are, mm, I don't want to take this job. Mm, I'm holding up for this. But I, I want to take some time off okay. or until a better job comes. Okay. Um, we don't have a lot in our economy because people, uh, you have people looking for jobs, but it's not like 
somebody is leaving a job to stay home to look for a job. Okay, there will be some people to do that, but not as many as in developed countries. Structural unemployment, are, however, results from a mismatch between the demand and supply of labor. The biggest problem we have is structural unemployment. The structure of the economy is such a way that it doesn't, one, produce enough jobs. And secondly, if it's producing jobs, it's producing it in sectors that people don't have a skill, the skill set to, 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 to move to. Let me put it in a different way. If the economy is producing jobs in the oil and gas sector or the IT sector, but we all hold sociology degrees, right? Or political science degrees, or I don't know, admin degrees, but the sectors, the, the, the sector that is booming, that needs a lot of employment or that requires a lot of, wants to, uh, that can, uh, can uh, uh, employ a lot of people, that sector uh, is, doesn't need sociology or psychology or administration degrees. It, then it doesn't mean that the economy doesn't have jobs. It's just that the jobs are being generated or created in sectors that we don't have a lot of people with a set of skills, okay? So structural employment results from a mismatch between the demand for and supply of labor. The economy, some part is demanding certain class of people, but the economy is supplying a different group of people. Or the last extent is the economy is not producing jobs at all. <laughs> it's structure. So uh, it results when the set of available jobs do not match the skills of available workers. Okay. So one is if there's a mismatch between demand and supply, meaning that at the economy level, demand for workers, for, for jobs, uh, demand for workers or for, uh, demand for workers and the supply of workers is equilibrium in that. Supply is more than demand. People are, so many people are coming out of universities but firms are not demanding so many of them. Structural issues. The second one, it's also the mismatch between the skills that are available, as I said. So the first one is the mismatch between demand and supply of labor. And the second one is not just the demand and supply, but the skills that firms, that firms want is different from the skills that people are coming to the labor market with. Okay. So that is it. It can arise from structural changes within the economy. So that is a structural problem. The economy is simply not demanding a lot of workers, but this economy is producing too many workers. Okay. Oh, so many people are coming into the labor market, but then the, the labor market is not able to absorb all of them. All right, it's can arise from structure change within the economy. The rise of new industry that renders some old industries obsolete uh, can create this mismatch in scales. Okay. If you remember when the typewriters began fading or when computers were coming, all the typists had to find jobs. Either you retrain to learn a computer or you're out of job. Okay. So the mismatch, the jobs were being created in other areas. Okay. So you can solve them. You can solve the second one by retraining people to take up jobs, but it's not very easy to retrain an accountant to be a, an engineer, an oil and gas engineer. It's very, you can't do that. Okay. Or the economy has employment slots for medical doctors. You cannot pick me and train me to become a medical doctor <laughs> in a year. Okay. So these are some of the challenges uh, we have. Let me see here how far I can get to. Cyclical unemployment is associated with the business cycle. Uh, it arises out of low demand for labor across many sectors of the economy. So cyclical unemployment, in periods where the economy is growing, GDP is increasing output, the growth rates in the economy, 8%, uh, 9%, 10% growth, the economy is really growing, then a lot of people will be employed. But uh, when the economy is not doing well, people will be laid off. Okay, so the economy goes through a, a cycle, business cycle. Output will fluctuate and employment will fluctuate along this output, okay, output changes. Let me see if I can use the whiteboard. Um, 
Yeah, so if I draw output increasing and then O4 and then O increase. So this is a cycle. PUS where the economy is producing a lot, PUS where economy is not doing so well. And this will all impact. So if I draw an X and Y axis, something like this. PUS where the economy is doing well, output is increasing, unemployment will fall. And PUS where the economy is not doing well, unemploy unemployment will rise. Okay. So you go through cycle, and that is cyclic uh, unemployment. Oops, oopsie, oopsie. Um, let me finish up. So it arises of low demand for labor across many sectors of the economy. And output is increasing and dipping. Um, let me see. Okay. So yeah, so seasonality is not uh, a big problem for us to solve. It's more of the structural problem. Seasonality, um, it's not a period where you, you just have an unemployment spell for a short period and then you get back to the labor market. The structural problem is if the economy is just not capable of producing enough jobs or if the economy is producing them in a different sector, then you have a problem. How do you solve the fact that the economy is not producing a lot? The economy just has to produce. Okay, we have to make low, create an enabling environment for people to start up businesses and to employ. Okay. Uh, come, I think, September, the number of people coming out from the universities is insane. It's huge okay. from all programs across all universities, technical universities, okay. huge. So. The economy should be structured to demand workers or create an environment where firms can easily expand, produce, export, and then employ. So the seasonality is not exactly linked to um, the output fluctuations in the, uh, the cyclical. Okay. But the cyclical one, it's basically because of low demand, okay? But some of the seasonality, it's more like weather induced, right? Or it's more like the company just says that between June and July, I'm shutting down for retooling, okay? So it's not a big, you are, it's a short spell that you have, okay? With, with, with the unemployment case. You may, some, in some developed countries, people who are find themselves in seasonal unemployment may end up searching for a job for two months or one month, okay? They will be more in the frictional state. They will not sit at home. They will still go into the labor market, but it's a very small percentage of people compared to the overall employment. All right, let me try to wrap up. Um, I don't know whether I can have the time to finish up. I should try and finish this up. Okay, um, the natural rate of unemployment, I've explained that the natural rate of unemployment in an economy will not be zero, even if the economy is producing at its maximum. So even if the economy is very efficient and producing at its maximum, there will still be some level of unemployment in the economy. Because people are searching for jobs and people are also sitting at homes because of seasonality. So it's possible. The unemployment rate that prevails in an economy when output and employment is at full level, it's called the natural rate of unemployment. So the natural rate of unemployment is saying, even if the country is very efficient and we are producing the maximum we can produce given our resources, what is be the unemployment rate that will exist? Say 5%. If the Nigerian economy is at full employment and very efficient, what will be the unemployment rate that will exist? Maybe 3% or 7%. So even if the economy is at its full potential, there will still be some people without a job, okay. but it may not be so much. So um, because frictional and structural unemployment are never zero, there will always be positive unemployment, even if an economy is producing at its potential level. The only concern we have is the, the rates. Okay. So this is the natural rate of unemployment when the economy is at its full potential.
Uh, economic cost of unemployment, we talked about the economic cost of uh, inflation. What are some of the economic costs of unemployment? Uh, if I open this up, you guys can tell me a lot. Let me go through the points. The main impact of unemployment can be classified into the economic cost and the social costs, or the economic impact and the social impact. The economic impact of unemployment refers to the loss of income. People lose job income, and therefore it affects their consumption and affects their well-being. Okay. So associated with unemployment, there is the output that the the if the person was employed, the output that the person would have produced would have earned the country some revenues. Okay, so this is the output uh, that the person could have produced if they were employed. We will lose that if the person was unemployed. So we have so many people who are unemployed, means that if, if they were in other economies, they will be producing output. So that is an economic cost. Ghana, we are not getting, and these people are not paying any revenues, so they are not paying income taxes. So we are losing a lot. So the economic cost can be very high. I don't know why it's freezing. Okay, according to Okun's law, so Okun has this law saying that, uh, which shows the relationship between um, the unemployment rate and the, the inflation rate, okay? According to Okun's law, for every two percentage fall in GDP relative to the to potential, the, the unemployment rate rises by a certain percentage. So Okun is saying, uh, the Okun is between, the relationship between GDP growth and unemployment. Okay, so he's saying that if the economy output falls by 2% or uh, percentage points, if the economy output falls by 2 percentage, 2%, two percent, relative to what the potential is supposed to be. Say the potential of the economy is to, uh, increase output by 10%, but economy reaches that falls by 2%. That will lead to a one percentage increase in unemployment. So any two percentage points that the economy deviate from potential in terms of output potential, it will create an unemployment of about a percentage, 1%. Okay. So it means that the opposite is true that if you are able to approach it, then we eliminate the unemployment rate, okay? So that is what the, the economy, um, the Okun's law st uh, stipulates, saying that if the economy deviates from potential or full employment, the unemployment rate will rise by certain percentage. Uh, and that is saying that if this is the potential of the economy, Y hat, hat or Y bar, the deviation from the Y bar uh, will influence the, the, the deviation from the natural rate of unemployment, okay? So you will be the natural rate of unemployment, say um, 5%. But if you are deviating from output so much, your U will be higher than the 5%, okay? So one to two, okay? So Y is actual output, why buy is full employment output? So if you deviate from full employment output, what happens to, what will happen to um, your deviation from your natural level of unemployment? You will also deviate from your natural level of unemployment, which will mean that the actual unemployment will rise okay, from away from the natural. So know that U minus U bar is the cyclical part when you are deviating from your natural unemployment. And deviating from the natural unemployment, which is triggered by output. Your output in such a period, the cycle, you are just in the trough. The output is falling, and therefore employment also deviates uh, from natural. And Okun's law, it can be restated, says that for the cycle unemployment rate is 1%, output will be 2% lower than full, full employment. So restating that that if unemployment increases by 1% during a period uh, in the economy, output will, um, if, uh, if unemployment is 1%, output will be two percentage points lower than full employment level of output. 
Okay, so the economic costs are clear. The economic cost of unemployment is equally borne by the entire labor force. The cost is disproportionately borne by those who lose their jobs, mainly in the form of loss of income. I'll come to you. I'll come to you. Let me just finish up. I'll take all the questions at the end. Okay, uh, Louis. Okay, even in advanced uh, countries where they pay unemployment insurance, some countries pay unemployment insurance, which is very good. So when you are working, uh, just like you pay pension, you also pay unemployment insurance. You put some money into an unemployment fund. In the event that you lose your job, the fund pays you close to some, depends on the country, some countries about 80% of your previous uh, recent salary. It's paid to you until you find a job. Typically, the design is in such a way that you can be on that unemployment support for about a year or two, depending on the country. Okay. So even in advanced countries where unemployment insurance is paid, this income shortfall can still be very difficult. 20% can still affect people's well-being okay, if you lose your job. Uh, Besides loss of income, extended periods of unemployment may lead to loss of scale. Like if you are unemployed for a long time, you lose the skill sets, okay, your confidence. Okay. The loss output also reflects in the loss of government tax revenues, which may have implications for the broader economy. Okay. The social impact, the social impact of unemployment goes beyond the economic costs. Extended periods of involuntary unemployment is associated with human and psychological costs. Unemployment can lead to poor mental health of affected people. If you're unemployed for a long time, you'll even be shy of people because you know the Ghanaians, Ghanaians ask too many questions. You know? So I like that, <laughs> that phrase, when they meet you and they are like, so where are you now? <laughs> okay, so that question is harmless, but it can put a lot of pressure on people. Okay, people be sensitive. Okay, where are you now? You just say, I'm in my house, okay. And you're good. Okay, so these are so it brings a burden. It's like where you are in life, you should be having this job or having this income or this. You know, we are not very sensitive when it comes to these things. Okay, you are not sensitive at all. Where are you? What where are you, what company do you work for? Who says I'm working for a company? You know, why do I have to work for a company? You know, so these are some of the issues, and it can the social effects are very high. It can lead to Increase social vices. People tend to do what they don't want, they will not have done, you know, normally. So uh, social vices uh, can lead to if somebody who is not alcoholic can become an alcoholic, like just losing their job. And they go into this uh, this circle that they even lose the confidence to apply for a new job. Okay. Don't give up. I, I spend quite a bit of time on this labor market part when I'm teaching level 400 because it's a whole course on, on that. And I always tell them that if you submit a CV and they don't call you back for um, an interview, don't feel bad about yourself, okay? And always put it in your head that it's the CV that they have rejected. It's not you, okay, just the CV. So maybe if you sit back and remodel your CV and change certain things that will make you stand out as best, but don't just say, okay, I didn't get a job. I'm not looking for, I like you, it's, it doesn't give you, you lose your confidence to even apply for a new job. Okay. It can have very dire consequences on your, your health. All right, and it can also lead to social unrest. If you have high levels of unemployment in the country, it can lead to social unrest. And this is particularly among the youth, people, young people with ambitions, dreams, they want to change the world. If you can get, create the jobs for them to change that world, um, then, uh, it can lead to social unrest. Okay. Yes, any question? Okay, I've seen some comments. Uh, getting a job is whom you know, I know. <laughs> uh, who's saying that? Uh, Matoda. Uh, somebody says that it's no longer whom you know, it's who knows you. Uh, you can know the person, but the person doesn't know you then we are still in trouble. Okay, so that um, ends the section on inflation and the costs, uh, but I'm sorry, we still have one more session um, to go through. 
um, which is, I don't know, let me see if I have it, monetary policy. Um, I don't, monetary policies. This is section that money, financial market and policy. I, I don't know what you guys uh, want to do. What I can do is that class rep can, we can talk later. I'm teaching this class tonight for um, MSc Accounting and Finance. Oops. Sorry, I don't know what happened. I think the PowerPoint. I hope you guys can hear me. Um, can anybody hear me? Yes, please. We can hear you. Okay. So mm -hmm. the last the last bit of the class is on as I said, the monetary policy. Um, I'm teaching that tonight at six p.m. for my accounting and finance students. Um, two things, either I record that lecture and share it or I give you guys access to join. Um, then I can end both classes. So um, the person acting as the, the rep, um, Teoflos, um, get in touch with me and let me know if it's something that we can do, then I can send you the link then you can share that class starts at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. Okay. So, I'll, I'll, so you guys can join. Okay. All right. Go through the this slide before that class. Make sure you go through the slide before that class. Uh, we have a class at this. You have a class at the same time. Okay. Somebody says they have a class at the same time. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So I'm going to record that for you guys. Okay. Sir, please, not all of us. So some of us can still join the link. If okay. They need Sir, if 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 you join the link and you are from this class, please notify me so that I can make you also a co-host. Okay, so the, those who will be joining, one of you will have to nominate himself as the co-host and record. Those who are using a computer, okay, and record. So I'll be expecting to see all of you guys um, around that time. Uh, some of you around that time. Okay. Um. Yeah. And here, and uh, I hope to see some of you. Uh, those I don't see, I will talk to you in person uh, after the exam. You can pass by, say hi. Uh, it's virtual, so I don't get to meet people. So I can get to meet some of you and get to know what you guys are into. I wish you guys the very best for the day. See you soon. Thank you.